Welcome to the Manifest Destiny 2022 virtual retreat. First time doing it as this in this format. I hope you guys got a lot out of this. I want wanted to bring in uh, experts in their field, people that can add a little bit more umph to what I've been trying to say for the last three years before I get to the science and some of my personal techniques and manifesting. Okay. Uh, of course, I got to do a little bit of the housekeeping because some people on here just found me for the first time. There's people that have just come across the Eventbrite link and said, hey, I, you know, I want to I, I want to uh, find out what this guy has to say. So my name is Billy Carson. I am the founder of Forbidden Knowledge, Inc. and Forbidden Knowledge TV. I'm a two time bestselling author of Compendium of the Emerald Tablets and also another book called Woke Doesn't Mean Broke. I'm an expert uh, host on many, many TV shows. I'm an expert host on ancient civilizations, on Gaia, deep space on Gaia. Uh, I'm on uh, Roswell, The Final Verdict, on Discovery. I'm on so many TV shows. I think right now I'm on three travel channel shows, uh, one history channel show, two Discovery channel shows, one Discovery Plus show. Uh, a, a ton of Gaia shows. And of course, I'm all over my own TV network, Forbidden Knowledge TV, which is where you're going to watch the replay of this event. Everyone's got an email with the link where the replay will be hosted as well. So you'll be able to log in there and watch this uh, entire event from start to finish again. OK, I'm also the co-founder of the United Family of Anomaly Hunters. And uh, basically, our mission is to provide evidence that there's not only uh, life that visited Earth in the ancient past, but there may potentially even be life currently in our solar system as we speak. And that's a whole nother workshop that I'm going to be doing coming up very, very soon. It's going to be a, a, a workshop about anomalies, and it's going to be very fascinating because I'm going to take everyone to Mars with me live, and we're going to get into the rover camera, and we're going to have a look around, Okay. Public access, guys, public access. It's going to be an amazing workshop, and it's free. It doesn't cost you any money. Uh, we have uh, pioneered two new fields of science, archaeoastronomy and um, astroanthropology. And I also am the CEO of First Class Space Agency, and we're specializing in research and development of several, several advanced technologies right now. Right now, I'm currently working on, besides the perpetual motion generator and the free energy devices, uh, I'm currently working on a, a new, fantastic, and amazing device. It's a deep space communications array that operates on quantum entanglement uh, through crystal sets. So it's a pretty amazing thing. And uh, that's a huge project you're going to hear a lot about in 2022, uh, especially as it goes into the patent pending stages. I'm in a lot of documentaries and TV shows. Like I said, if you want to find out what TV shows and documentaries I'm in, Go to IMDb. This is actually an old one. There's even more stuff in there now. Uh, it's, I'm in hundreds of shows. So you can go to IMDb. That's the Internet Movie Database. Uh, IMDb.com and just type in Billy Carson. And a lot of the shows, documentaries and so forth that, that I've been in should pop right up for you. Of course, I have my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, which is a bestseller now for over two years. It's a book on ancient civilization, specifically Thoth, the Atlantean priest king, who actually talks a lot about manifestation in the book, <coughs> excuse me, in his tablets. And then we have Woke Doesn't Mean Broke, which is my best-selling book, uh, combining spiritual practices with financial literacy. And of course, the Forbidden Knowledge TV network. We have the classic logo and of course, the new uh, Space Age logo. Uh, but Forbidden Knowledge TV, right now is doing phenomenal numbers and we just signed 10 new 10 people to new tv show deals so we have 10 new high quality production shows coming out on the same level that you would find on any mainstream tv network two of them have been released already episode three or four might be out already on ufo chronicles starring richard dolan and episode one was just released the other day uh, of Mysteries of the Gods, and that is hosted by Eric Von Daniken, the great legend Eric Von Daniken. And then we have behind that eight new shows being filmed, and some in post, some in editing, and so forth. And mine should be airing sometime next week, uh, Ancient Connections. So we had a little bit of a delay in releasing it just because our producer, I mean, our, our post editor was, was uh, sick. You know, everybody's getting sick now. So but it's, uh, it's coming out. So hopefully next week, the first episode of Ancient Connections will be out. My social media app, media app Unite the 99, 
Uh, it's a five-star app on your app store. And we have a private group just for this Manifest Destiny retreat. So when you get done with this, you can join Unite the 99, then look for the Manifest Destiny group and ask to join. We'll verify that you are an attendee of this event and we'll add you to that private group and we'll build a little community in there where we can network together, okay? I'll be in there dropping some knowledge as well. Now, <coughs> excuse me. So um, some of you may have heard a little bit of my story in the past and I'm gonna have to, there'll be a small overlap just because I really think it's important that you know, you understand where I came from and what, what put me on this path. So for some of you who may have heard this before, just hang out. It's not going to be that long. I just want to give an overview of where I came from, how I got on this path, and what really drives me. What is, what is the underlying basis of thought that has put me on this trajectory, okay? <clears throat> what you're seeing right here is a picture of the city uh, that I grew up in. This is actually one block over <laughs> You see the do not cross police tape there, right? A lot of shootings, killings, murdering, stabbings, um, just the crazy stuff. I, I, we, I was born in New York, but my parents moved down to uh, this place in Miami called Opalaka in the early 1970s. Uh, mid, I'm sorry, mid 1970s. And we had gone down in the early 70s to check it out and visit uh, my dad's sister who was down there. He had a half sister down there. And they made a decision that, okay, we'll come back in a few years. And we did. So we ended up moving right down the street from her, the house we used to go and visit. Uh, so we got a house for rent and a little uh, two bedroom house uh, that we rented out over there. And it was right in the heart of the hood. This city had a gate around it. It used to have this triangular fence that went around the whole city. It was called the Bermuda Triangle uh, or the Triangle. It even has its own Wikipedia page. And the reason why it was so deadly was because inside that triangle is where all the crime was. And we were right inside the triangle. And it was so deadly in there to like, if you would call the cops or crime is going on, sometimes they wouldn't even show up. <laughs> it was like, we're not going in there, you know? So it was really like, you know, every man for himself. It, it was really a, a crazy, crazy place. I remember you guys just saw Maria on here. Uh, she's actually in the upstairs room in my house. She's actually visiting right now from, from Germany. She's working me mm -hmm. out. But I remember one night we were uh, in the house and my parents, they were, you know, newspaper delivery people. So they would be out all night delivering newspapers because you delivered newspapers late in, in the, you know, or early in, really early in the morning, late night, early morning. Back then, you know, newspapers, obviously nobody had internet back then, didn't even exist. Wasn't even a thought yet, I don't think. But, you know, the, the, the people in the neighborhood would be checking our doorknobs and trying to break into the house. And I'd have to go get a butcher knife and put up a, uh, you know, knock down the, uh, the little dining table we had, the dinette, and get the kids behind it, my brother and my sister behind it, and stand guard with that butcher knife all night to make sure if anybody came in, they was going to get the best that I can give them. I was a little kid, but whatever I can give them, they was going to get it. You know, and so, you know, that in between the bullets and the shootings and the helicopters, I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare. And this ice cream truck would come and it looked just like this but without the clown on top. That clown is kind of scary. I'm kind of scared of clowns. I ain't gonna lie. But the ice cream truck would come and the people in the neighborhood would go to the ice cream truck every day. I didn't have the money for the ice cream truck every day. And it was like perplexing me that these people living here with us in the same area are extremely poor, but they can go to the ice cream truck and they can afford to get ice cream every single day. Sometimes seven days a week, the same kids were going to the ice cream truck. And I'm like, damn, I can't even get, I just want to get the bazooka bubble gums. Right. And so uh, it, it was, it would have me scratch my head. Like, I don't understand where are they getting this money from? You know, from my, from my perspective as a kid, I'm trying to figure out how in the world were they able to do this? If we're all poor, and I'm assuming that everybody's at the same level that we were, we were really super, super poor. I mean, we had our furniture that we had in there was all donated. You know, uh, the food that we had was mostly matzo crackers with butter. We had uh, powdered milk. We had powdered eggs. You'd have to add water to make it into to something. Uh, donated cereal, dented cans from the grocery store that you can get for three and four cents a piece. You know, um, and, you know, it was just it was hard pickings in, in the beginning. It was really hard pickings when we first got to Florida. 
So I said to myself, wow, I had some toys that I brought down from New York because we drove from New York to Miami. We didn't fly, obviously. And uh, I had some toys, a little box of toys that I had brought with me. And I said, OK, I'm going to just go door to door and ask for donations for these toys. I don't need toys. I just want to go to the, to the ice cream. I just wanted to feel like a normal kid, you know. So I went door to door with my toys and I started asking, ma'am, sir, five dollars, 10 cent, a penny, whatever you can. I'm just asking for donations so I can have money for the ice cream truck. I don't need these toys anymore. And people started giving me money for my toys. And I was like, wow. After I got done, I was like, man, it dawned on me like there's nobody going to come save me. There's nobody that is going to come and save me except for me. I realized I was in a situation. I had uh, 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 something that I wanted to do in that situation, which was just simply be able to be normal and go to the ice cream truck and get something, specifically that bazooka bubblegum, because they had comic strips inside. Now, I, wa I wanted to read the comic strips. And I said, if I would have just sat down and did nothing, I would have been in the same position. But just the next day, when the ice cream truck came, I was at the truck and I was getting the bazooka gum. And I realized the only person that's going to come and save me is going to be me. There's no one that's going to come save you. It's going to be up to you to make that first initial step, to take that first conscious thought and then put the action behind it, which we're going to talk about a lot today. So, you know, when you're looking at, uh, when you're thinking about manifesting things, you're thinking about bringing things into your reality, right? All of a sudden you begin to realize you get a lot of great thoughts about what you could possibly do in a situation. But then do you actually do them? That's where a lot of people fall off. I'm a person that takes action. I take action. I don't, sometimes I don't even think. Now, something you're supposed to think. Sometimes I move too fast. I've, you know, I've done that, made that mistake in the past. But overall, versus the times that I fail and the times that I've won, those, those, my ability to take action has put me in a great situation in my life right now. A lot of people that I know have the greatest ideas. I know people that have produced so much incredible music and haven't released one song. I'm not the greatest producer in the world. I don't even pretend to be. But I got 300 songs in global distribution right now, and it pays me every single month like clockwork. And these people who are 10,000 times better than me don't even have one song on Apple Music or Shopify, Spotify or whatever. And I'm like, wow, what is it? The action, they are not taking action. These are the toys, just as an example of, you know, selling broken toys, man. Just, this is what it looked like, a hodgepodge of mess. I mean, these people obviously didn't, they didn't really need these toys. These people, I was going door to door. They were just like, man, felt sorry for me, you know, and gave me some change. And there was a picture that I took. This isn't it here, obviously, but I had a picture that I, famous picture I took. I'm standing next to my cousin, Carnell, and my brother's on the other side, and I've got this hand two hands out with money in both of my hands. It's like change and a couple of dollars, you know? <coughs> and um, a little bit, just a little, a little bit more backstory as we move on before we move into this, into the science and stuff, you know? So uh, long story short, in that city, we ended up, it was so treacherous there. We ended up moving to another city named, uh, called uh, North Miami, closer to Liberty City, which is also still ghetto. As a matter of fact, the street that we lived on had a lot of prostitution. We had uh, a lot of the daily motels where people would, they looked like little quadruplexes, but people were paying to live by the day, right? Uh, so these are very transient area, but not too far from a nice area, believe it or not. Just a few blocks away, you're like looking at people living good. And right where we were, people were, you know, living and we were in a one bedroom apartment the size of my home office. And that included the bedroom, the bathroom. Uh, me, my, myself and my brothers and sisters all slept on one couch bed, right? Um, and uh, it was a trip, you know? And I'd go to school and I didn't have money for a lot of clothes. We didn't have money for a lot of clothes. So uh, I would dye my, I would bleach my clothes. I would ble bleach my pants. I'm sorry, I would bleach my pants. And then I would, I would dye them with rich dye. It was like 59, 69 cents. I had holes in my shoes. I would take cardboard. My brother and I would take cardboard and put that inside the shoe to keep our feet from touching the street. And my crotch would always rip. You see the rip crotch there because I was growing like weeds. I was growing so fast. Uh, so my pants were always high waters and the crotch was always ripped open. So I'd wear really, really long shirts to cover up the open crotch. 
you know, just to give you an idea, I'm just trying to give you an idea where, where I'm coming from here. And so one day we went, we went to the laundromat to wash clothes and, you know, Miami in the summer, you know, you add the heat of the laundry room plus the pavement and the sun, you're talking probably 105, 106 degrees out there. So this was my first experience now in getting into a thought experiment. I didn't know what, I didn't know what meditation was at this time. This is uh, 1977, 78, somewhere in there. And I'm sitting down at the the laundromat on the curb, on the hot curb. And I said, I just want to take myself away from here. And so I said, I'm going to focus on being in Alaska because I knew Alaska was cold. You had Eskimos and igloos. So I start, I sat down, I closed my eyes. I started taking some deep breaths. This is untrained stuff in the 70s. And I just did a thought experiment for myself and I focused on Alaska and I literally felt like I started to get cool and then I felt cold. When I came out of this meditation, which I later knew, learned what I had done, my skin was even slightly cooler to the touch. And I realized, wow, there's a lot of power in the mind. The mind, I knew then that the mind was able to trans traverse space and time. I knew then at that young age that the mind can literally, I can leave and I can go anywhere with my consciousness. So I learned two huge lessons in such a short period of time coming to Florida. One was that that I am my own savior and I must take action behind my conscious thought. And the second thing was that the mind is so powerful, the mind can take me through space and time. I can, I can basically travel. I can time travel, leaving the body in one place and sending the mind somewhere else. And I can have a totally separate experience from the one experience, which was incredible. <clears throat> so what happened was we um, we ended up uh, going. I ended up got that school, North Miami High School, and that school was a mixed school. It was uh, at that time it wasn't fully black. Right now it's a completely black school, um, and it was kind of mixed. And so you would have to take the bus to get there because it was about three miles away from the apartment we lived in. On the bus, unfortunately, <clears throat> you know, kids born and raised the wrong way, they would be calling me, you know, racial slurs. As I'm walking by to get to my seat and me reacting fast, I just turn around and punch somebody, you know, and I'd get kicked off the bus. <laughs> so I get kicked off the bus. I got to walk home for a week or two, three mile walk. It was the biggest blessing of my life because I would just go to the library and I would hang out at the library. I stayed there for three hours. The library was my my best and my greatest friend. I go to the library, I take my time going, I'll just go to the library and hang out, and read books. <clears throat> so I started doing that. One day I got kicked off the bus and I was uh, one week I was, I was kicked off the bus and I headed to a library, that same library in North Miami. And uh, I saw this <clears throat> ballot box on the counter and the ballot box said, uh, when a HUD, when a uh, HUD homes, win $30,000 are put down on a HUD home. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. You can put $30,000 down on a HUD home. I'm like, what is this all about? So I said, let me, um, let me look into this. So I put, I pull out the, one of the little ballot sheets and I'm reading it. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty interesting. I think at this point, at this age, I'm about 11 years old. Hold on one second, guys. I'm just trying to clear my throat because uh, I'm still suffering from a little bit of asthma. And so at this point, I'm trying to um, analyze what this thing needs and what all the information I got to fill out on it. I said, okay, I think I can fill this thing out. So I go home and I tell my mom, I say, look, I'm going to come home late again tomorrow because uh, I'm going to go back to the, the library and fill out this HUD form. I just need that, some of dad's information. She was like, really? I said, yeah, I'm going to fill this form out to win a house. You know, give you 30000 to put down on a house, a HUD home. A HUD home is a government-owned property. So the government buys up properties in different areas, and then they resell those properties to people under this HUD program, housing program. And it's typically very, for low-income families, very low down payments and so forth. And so I filled it out. I submitted that ballot. And then about maybe I'd say two months at max later, this manila envelope comes in the mail. And when I looked at it, I saw a HUD on the top corner. I knew already we won. So I went and handed the packet to my dad. He jumped so high, he hit his head in the door frame of the door in the apartment. <clears throat> and... Um, we had one to thirty thousand dollars to put down on that house, and so again, 
demonstrating my my mental was how can we get out of here because this place is not good there was so much more i mean i could talk for hours about the place that we were living in and <clears throat> all the turmoil that we were going through but my thing was how could we how could i get us the entire family out of here how do we how do we live like the people living around the corner my dad would take us on these trips around the corner to this other neighborhood that was so pristine and so beautiful and i'm going man how do we get to that level. Like, what is the process? What is the step, you know? And focusing and thinking about that and trying to figure out what could it be that can get us to change where we are now to that. And then all of a sudden, something as little as stumbling into a library and seeing a ballot box. The universe took my frequency and it became a boomerang that came back and it dropped a, uh, uh, what do you, a breadcrumb in front of me. <clears throat> now, what happens, and we're going to talk about this later, they drop, you get these breadcrumbs all the time, but a lot of the times we don't see the breadcrumbs. We don't see them for what they are. We don't see that they lead us somewhere. I could have saw that thing and said, wow, you know, I, I, I'm a kid. I can't fill this stuff out or, or this is dumb or not even look at it. <clears throat> but I took the time to walk over, not only look at it, take it out, read it, go home, meditate on overnight, get the information I needed, go back and fill out the form. That's how we got out of the ghetto. We moved into a more of a lower middle class neighborhood, which at the time was pretty nice when we first got there because it was still a blended neighborhood and it wasn't a lot of crime at that time. Now the crime has kind of gone through the roof. Why? You know, I don't understand how governments and politics allow economics to uh, become this way where no matter how much you try to move up, it seems like the problems follow. But that's a whole other story. Anyway, we got to a very a much nicer place, bigger house. We had a pool. We had a front yard, a backyard. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't have any money, but that was OK. At least we were in, a, in a, what appeared to be a much better place. <clears throat> we, had a, we had our own bedrooms and so forth. It was pretty cool. T Channel 17 News came out and recorded us and, and videotaped us and put us on the news. It was a, it was a pretty big thing. But again, I'm learning these lessons as I'm, as I'm growing. I'm stopping and I'm thinking, wow, if I never went to that box, if I never took the time to walk those miles, if I never took the time to get the information I needed to put on the forms and fill out those forms correctly, none of this would have ever happened. So I literally single-handedly, through manifestation, got my family out of the ghetto into a nicer place. <clears throat> so I've been learning this manifestation and living the manifestation for a long time. This is the house right here. This is the actual house in Miami, Florida, in Norland. It's in the neighborhood of Norland that we actually moved to. You can see we got a nice yard there. There's a backyard and everything else. Uh, very simple house, very plain Jane, but it got the job done. Uh, the garage was converted into an extra room over there. It was already done like that when we got there. Uh, you know, and so we had a place to to lay our heads where we didn't have to worry about getting shot through the windows at night, literally, you know, that's what it had come down to in the previous places. So it was a big change, big change for us. Now, what happened was we changed the location. We changed to a better place, but we didn't have any money. <laughs> and I mean, none. So the income didn't change. <clears throat> and uh, I remember when I turned 12, we moved in this house when I was 11. When I turned 12, we were in this house and my dad called me in the room and he said, <clears throat> From this point forward, you have to buy your own clothes, your own school clothes and everything, your own school supplies, and you're going to have to start paying rent. Yeah. I wrote about this in my book, Woke Doesn't Mean Broke. <clears throat> and I said, wow, OK, uh, what do I do? Is there a, how do I find a job? And he hand, handed me this paper called the Miami News. Back then, it was a competitor to uh, the Miami Herald. And it said they were looking for kids 12 to 16 to sell newspaper subscriptions. And so back then, you can do this. You can't do this kind of stuff now because the world has really gone mad. But back then, a guy would come in a pickup truck and pick up all the kids that worked for the news. And he'd take us to a neighborhood and he'd say, square the block. And you go door to door around that entire block until you got back to the corner where he dropped you. You'd knock on every door and try to sell a newspaper subscription. I became the number one newspaper subscription salesperson on my team. I even won a trip to the Keys, to Key West because of my sales. 
Uh, and while my other friends were taking that money, which wasn't a lot, I mean, we we're probably making between 80 to 120 bucks. A good week for me would, would be 150 bucks. But back then, you got to think this is now like the early 80s. <laughs> Excuse me, decent money for a kid, right? So I said, like, great, great. So I take my money and I start saving it. I pay my little money that my parents wanted me to give them, you know, and I, I took care of whatever I had to take care of for myself in terms of school clothes or whatever. Uh, and I literally just saved my money. Now, what's interesting is I started getting interested in this magazine I would see my mom reading called the Opportunity Magazine. She had a couple of them that I saw. They were really, really old, though. I went to the grocery store one day for her <clears throat> and I saw the real nice ones. They had two different ones. They were up a couple of you know feet above my hand. I couldn't really get to them. One day when I went in, though, it was right down in front of me. And I grabbed it and I opened it. And when I opened it, it opened right up to uh, this company called Galaxy Electronics. Now, this page here you're looking at is the Opportunity Magazine. They have, they're on the web now. And they're still in, <coughs> excuse me, they're still in business. Let me just drink this. <clears throat> I had a really bad asthma attack the other day because um, I got, believe it or not, I was in a building in uh, Rochester, New York. It was a Marriott. And the fifth floor caught on fire. <clears throat> and it was 20 degrees outside and they put me outside for uh, three hours and my asthma started acting up. And I've been trying to get it cleared out ever since. Anyway, so uh, this opportunity uh, uh, company now has a web. This is all the different categories that they list opportunities in. and the people with opportunities, companies with opportunities of wholesale products, they list their company in here so that people can partake. So that's how I found out about this company. When I opened it up, it opened right up to Galaxy Electronics. Now, ironically, a week before, more manifestation. A week before, I was in my friend's um, dad's car, and he was tuning the radio. It was old turn dial radio. Back then, it was not old because it's what we had, right? Eight-track player with a turn dial. And I had on one of these calculator watches. The only thing I bought with my money was a 1995 calculator watch from Kmart. I recognized that these digital readout numbers were going to be the same thing that would show up on radios. I said to him, he said, now you're crazy. I said, I'm telling you, this is going to be on that soon. Now, a week later, I'm in the store and I open up this thing and they, they have digital car radios for wholesale. And I'm like, wow, I got to get my hands on these. This is my ticket. I knew right away, if I could sell these digital car radios, I'm going to, I'm going to take myself to the next level. And that's exactly what I did. I started, I, I called the company. I ordered a batch of radios. The guy said, you sound like a kid. I said, no, no, I'm just getting over a cold. It was COD back then. It didn't matter. COD, cash on delivery. They sent me the radios. I got the radios. I sold the radios to upperclassmen in high school. Word got around. This guy's got these radios for only $45. Digital car radios, high power. And the orders started coming in left and right. People were coming from the Tri-County area to buy these car radios from me. I was making an absolute killing on these car radios. Nobody could beat my prices. Why? Because I didn't have any overhead. I was doing it from my front yard. I was killing it. Radios were going off. You know, I couldn't even keep them in stock. I would reorder and reorder and reorder. The, the, the UPS driver was like, what are you doing, kid? <laughs> you know, I started buying myself shoes. I was like, from this point forward, I'm never going to have a shoe with a hole in it ever again in my life. I had so many pairs of Nikes that used to call me Nike man at school. I had 21 pairs of Nikes. That's enough to go every single day for a month in school, five days a week without having to repeat, you know, the shoes and so forth. And one pair for, for basketball practice <clears throat> <clears throat> or playing at the park. And so um, I was seeing how my decisions and my actions and my intuitiveness and my ingenuity were helping to change my life. And I was recognizing that. Now, what's interesting is, my parents, who were still struggling delivering newspapers, um, didn't have a way out. And my mom had fell down in the grocery store when Dixie right around the corner. And I happened to be in the store at the same exact time. And uh, she slipped on some water leaking out of the ice chest uh, from the fish. The fish cooler had broken and it leaked all the ice into the aisle. She slipped and fell. Long story short, she won $5,000. I said, Mom, I know the exact machine you got to get to. I know the exact thing you can invest this money in, by the way. And she said, what is it? I said, this Von Schrader company, they have a, a carpet cleaning machine for $4,999. It cleans carpet and it cleans upholstery with some new technology called dry foam extraction, which allows your 
carpet to dry fast and doesn't get the uh, the padding wet, so there's no mold and smell, and also dries it cleans and dries the upholstery very rapidly for couches and so forth. She said, "Well, how in the world am I going to get customers?" I said, "You deliver newspapers every night, make flyers and put them in each newspaper, and when you deliver the newspaper, you're delivering your ad at the same time." And those people are going to call you because they know you, they love you and trust you. But you've been delivering their papers for years. They give you Christmas bonuses and gifts and everything. And it worked. She went from making $12,000 a year to $70,000 a year, almost overnight. And back then, that was good money. That was very, very good money. You know, but again, it's seeing the vision. It's understanding the opportunity. It's seeing the breadcrumb. The breadcrumb was the blessing of the $5,000. Where do you put it? What do you do with it? Then how do you take action behind that? How do you manifest that this will turn into an income stream? All this stuff we're going to cover tonight. <clears throat> so I just wanted to go over that with you real quickly. Kind of the short version. There is an actual movie that's going into the writing stages right now. It's a movie of my life, my life story, even though my life story isn't complete. But by the time this thing goes into production, I should have received, re reached a specific accolade that I set for myself. I uh, should be at that accolade by the time that this thing is actually ready to be released. So I'm very uh, happy to put this out to work on this project because I think it's going to, there's a lot, there's so much to it. So many ups and downs and ins and outs and things that I went through and things, mistakes that I made and everything else. I want everybody to see everything and learn from this and be able to be to shortcut some issues and some problems and some situations and also to be able to be grateful for their current situation that they're in because there's always somebody that's worse off than you and you have no idea what somebody's struggling with what they're going through what their financial status is you know you just never know uh, there could be people that are you know look like they're you know on top of the world and their bank account could have 5 bucks in it you just never ever know what people are dealing with behind the scenes Public is one thing. Private is a totally separate thing. All right. So now we're going to get into the science behind manifestation and the law of attraction and how it actually works. One of the things people like about me, what I do is I like to bring science into the mix because I think that science really explains the spiritual aspect of nature. And so if you can understand the science and the way it's actually working, then you can begin to understand how the actual process is working. A lot of the times if you go in blind, right, and you really don't understand how to come to the solution, you're just feeling in the dark. A lot of people know there are multiplication tables. How do you learn them? Because you look at that square grid and you memorize all the answers. You don't really know why, you know, two times two is four. You just say four. But if you ask even an adult, like, why is, why is that? Can you explain it to me? They'll have to stop and pause. Not everyone, but a lot of people have to stop and pause for a second to explain it. We need to understand how one thing here connects to this thing, which then gives you this thing. If you don't understand how the process is working behind the veil, a lot of the times you can get lost in the process. You can get what they call lost in the sauce, right? So it's really important. So can quantum effects in the brain explain consciousness. So some research was done and they found out that um, the brain itself is a quantum computer. Not only is it a quantum computer, but the neurons and the synapses even between the neurons, sometimes they phase in and out of existence from this dimension. Where are they going? They're starting to really dig into this and they started realizing that we are multidimensional beings, and even in our thought processes are multi multidimensional. And our minds also have the capability of quantum entangling with information out in the universe in other places, even other dimensions. That's real peer-reviewed science. That's not Billy Carson coming up with some great idea or something that sounds fantastic. No, this is real science. Scientists studying the quantum mind or quantum consciousness has come up with a hypothesis proposing that the classical mechanics cannot explain consciousness. It posits that quantum mechanical phenomena, such as entanglement and superposition, may play an important part in the brain's function and could explain consciousness. So the fact that we're even conscious at all is because we're part of a collective universal consciousness. What this is saying is 
we are all connected to this giant web of energy through this one mind, this universal mind. And we're just a small aspect of that mind, but we're all linked and, and it's multidimensional. And we're actually connected even to the higher and lower dimensions. And we're connected via something called superposition via quantum entanglement. And then superposition means any and all possibilities that can happen will happen, kind of like Murphy's Law, right? Probabilities exist along with this conscious universal mind. And because of that, there's a whole other thing that we can go into with the multiverse or alternate realities. But the fact that we now are coming to the understanding that the mind is encapsulating a multidimensional stream of consciousness that's entangled other places in the entire universe and in higher dimensions, that's huge. That's because that means that you can get information from almost anywhere. Sometimes you come up with a great idea. You'd be like, man, this is a great idea. But what really happened is you downloaded that idea. That information already existed. You happened to match the same frequency as that information, and you were able to encapsulate it, download it, and then you were the one blessed enough to actually discern it. That's why when you come up with good ideas, you shouldn't just go, oh, this is a great idea, and then forget all about it in the next five minutes and walk away and don't even write it down, don't think about it anymore. Because the, the, the miracle that you were even to, able to get that tidbit of information, download it and actually discern it and recognize it as a probability is amazing. And you could be one of maybe only a few people, maybe even in the universe that, that happened to at that particular moment with that particular information. So it's important. You know, I, I, my phone is full of voice notes like you wouldn't believe. I don't know if I have three or four thousand voice notes on this phone. Now, do I go and, and go through every single one every single day? No, obviously. But as soon as something like that happens to me, I just make a quick voice note because I know that is something powerful. I might need to go back to that. It may tie me or link me to something else that I may need, need in the future. So those kind of ideas, those kind of downloads, <clears throat> why are they hugely important? Hugely important. Don't, don't discard them uh, as just you know no big deal. The fact that you were able to go through that process just to get that information is huge, right? <clears throat> Quantum physics offers a probable explanation for the feasibility of this law. One of the founding fathers of quantum physics and Nobel Prize winner, Max Planck, once said, as a man who, do, who, as a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about the atoms this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particles of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume that behind this force, the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This is the mind of the matrix, the matrix of all matter. Okay. So what are we talking about here? Max, Max Planck, one of the greatest quantum physicists of all time, is saying that we're living in a, a holographic universe made of waves of light and frequency and vibration. And every atom is, is, is operating or, or, or vibrating at a specific frequency. All right? And it goes much deeper than that. Um, what he began to really pull away the veil was is that we are really living in a, a, a conscious matrix. A matrix made of light. So the movie has a lot of real good correlations to this. It's really amazing. This conscious matrix is like we're living in a creation that is artificially intelligent or maybe or div divinely intelligent uh, that has the capability of running software programs and then allowing spiritual beings to inhabit coding, like inhabit an avatar body, like I'm inhabiting this avatar body right now. This body is not really me. Who am I? Right? Who am I? Who is me? You know, I'm Billy Carson. Well, like Proctor, Bob Proctor says, well, who is Billy Carson? That's the name that was given to you. Right? This body is not really me. I'm I'm utilizing this body right now in this temporal moment, but the real me is not even here. I'm I'm a stream of information that's being encapsulated into this body to and for the purpose of animation to animate it. So let's look at this matrix a little bit. <clears throat> Where do you find the matrix? Well, the matrix itself, and even the movie, they got that name from the Bible. 
the matrix, <clears throat> the name, the term matrix, that actually comes from the Bible. Five Bible results for the matrix from the King James Version, Exodus 13, 12, thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's. And in Exodus 13, 15, and it come to pass that the Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of the beast. Therefore I sacrifice the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but the firstborn of all my children I redeem. And I can go on and on and on. So what is this matrix that they keep talking about this being born? What is this being born that they're talking about? I mean, you just look at it. Every single one is basically saying the same exact thing. When you really analyze these verses, you begin to understand that what the writer is trying to tell you is that there's two realities. One reality, what you're living in, which is uh, artificial. In other words, it's this programming code. It's this coded reality. And then to get to the true reality, you have to be born. You have to be born. In other words, you have to come out of the womb. You have to uh, awaken, right? And that's really what it is, is raising yourself to a higher level of consciousness. What does the matrix mean in the Bible? It's the translation of the Hebrew word, rechem, which means womb. The matrix is a womb. And what does a womb do? It births, right? And openeth meaning that which, uh, that which opens. So the phrase means that which opens the womb. So we're talking about giving birth. So when you exit the matrix, according to the Bible, you're being born again. You're being born into a higher level of thought, a higher level of con. You're becoming aware of what's really happening, what's really going on. You're, you're now gaining another level of awareness. Before, you were just operating on the programming code, right? So when you begin to develop this level of consciousness and you begin to understand that we are living in a matrix, a matrix that's coded. Where there's the, the, the fact that I believe it's divine energy, it doesn't really make a difference. What the true reality of it is, the divine energy is being, in my opinion, transmitted into this dimension. I believe that the human consciousness is coming in from higher dimensions and streaming down and then being encapsulated into this mind. <clears throat> and then once you, once you actually uh, understand it, you realize that you're just a digit. You being in this body is like being a digit on a radio, uh, uh, radio uh, channel, right? A, a radio uh, station. So in other words, if I have, if I own a radio station and I'm broadcasting out radio stations, radio signals, and people are picking up these signals, 99.1, 99.2, 99.3, and so forth and so on. I could be 99.1. That's the frequency that I've encapsulated from the universal consciousness. You're 99.2, that person 99.3. And so our avatars are tuned to these specific frequencies. We're picking up these frequencies. We're animating these bodies and we're operating. Now, the thing about these bodies is these bodies, these avatars, they come with programming code built in. They come with RNA, they come with DNA. We know this for a fact through just simple science that our bodies store 15 to 20 generations of epigenetic memories. We come in here hard-coded with memories and information from ancestors in our body that's very hard to escape. What this scene here in the Matrix is, <clears throat> it's showing you he had gotten to the point where he understood that that was true and that was a version of his reality. But the new reality and the new paradigm he's creating is he's understanding that he can reprogram his own body. He can reprogram his own mind because he realized the coding in our bodies can be altered and changed. This, is, this has now been proven to be true, and we're going to cover that shortly. <clears throat> Another thing that's interesting about our reality is in this third dimension, <clears throat> what we're considering to be solid matter is not really solid matter at all. And so we're living in this illusory state of being in the third dimension where solid matter really only is solid based off of the illusion from a hologram projected from our own mind. Let me explain further. In physics, they found out that everything that exists in the third dimension exists as a wave. Waves of what? Waves of light. We can't see them because we only see a small percentage of the light spectrum, but they are waves of light. 
and I mean everything exists as waves, all particles, atoms, everything, quarks, leptons, they all exist as waves of light, okay? What happens is when a conscious observer or consciousness interacts with those waves, they collapse those waves into solid matter. This right here, what you're looking at is the first picture, photograph of a particle that is in the middle stages of converting from a wave into a particle. This is something in quantum physics we call wave particle duality. So in physics and chemistry, wave particle duality holds that light and matter exhibit properties of both waves and particles. A central concept of quantum mechanics, duality addresses the inadequacy of conventional concepts like particle and wave to meaningfully describe the behavior of quantum objects. The idea of duality is rooted in a debate over the nature of light and matter dating back to the 1600s. And we've known about this for a very, very long time. Isaac Newton and Christian Huygens would debate about this back in the day. But now finally today, we've got proof, we have validation that nothing is really here except consciousness, okay? Consciousness is what's really here. And what's interesting is, for example, even the fact that I can pick up this jar, right? I'm holding this jar in my hand. I don't know if you can see me or not. I'm holding a jar. But the only thing that stops my hand from passing through that jar, because we know that atoms are mostly empty space, I'm not actually touching the jar. What's happening is the atoms in my, the electromagnetic frequency around the atoms in my fingers are, are repelling the electromagnetism in the atoms in this jar. And so what's happening is, I think I'm actually holding this jar, but I'm not holding it. This is a result of magnetic field repulsion. Now, if I were to phase shift the atomic frequency of the vibration of the atoms in my hand, I can pass them right through this jar and the liquid in the jar with no problem. With no problem. My hand wouldn't even be wet. I'd pass it right through if I can match that subatomic frequency, right? So we know that what, what is here is really truly illusory. But the benefit to knowing this is understanding that there's a superposition. Everything exists only as probabilities until it's collapsed into a reality. That's what's important about what I'm saying. Your reality is not fixed. Your destiny is not hard-coded and set. It can be changed. It can be altered. The Anunnaki, they had a, uh, they, a few of them called themselves the ordainers of destiny, all right? And so what they would do is they would look at this crystal tablet that they had. It sounds like a sounds like a, uh, a you know an iPhone tablet or whatever you guys call the iPad, right? And they would see all the superpositions, all the possibilities that could happen um, based on decisions that they would make, and then they would pick one, and then they would then make all the decrees and all the rules and laws based on the reality they want to collapse into their own reality tunnel, and they call themselves the ordainers of destiny. See showing that there's a superposition, meaning that there's multiple things that can happen depending on what decision you think or what decision you make. And that information can be collapsed into one solid reality. And wave particle duality is huge because it proves that we're living in a projected hologram. We are living in a creation. There's no doubt the Bible, the Quran, the Sumerian tablets, the, the Enumi Elish, the Mahabharata, we're living in a created universe. There's no way to dispute that. It's created. We know that the, we know the mathematics now. The mathematics have been discovered in supersymmetry by Professor James Gates at University of Maryland, former presidential uh, scientific advisor. They discovered, him and his team of physicists discovered that we are living in a program matrix and the code that operates and allows us uh, this, this matrix to form and actually operate is the same as that code that runs search engine browsers and websites on your computer and your phones. We're in this, we live in that code. That's the code we're living in. No wonder why we made it as above, so below. We duplicated what's already inside of our processing. We just, re we just replicated it and made it a website, made an internet, made a website, you know, made phones that run on the same coding and programming. It's a special kind of coding called error correcting codes. We're living in that exact same system. Uh, from this quote unquote biological standpoint, but everything, including our bodies, exist as waves of light. Matter of fact, when you're not looking at something, it doesn't even, it's not even there. If you're not home and you're not looking at your house, the house is a wave, a wave of probabilities. Now, that wave has a specific frequency. So when you look at it or when somebody else looks at it, 
those waves collapse into that same frequency. That frequency is locked into a, specific, a particular shape of a structure. So we can all identify the same type of structure when it's looked at, right? When you look at me, I'm collapsing. You collapse a wave function into this avatar body that has a, a look that no matter who looks at me, it's, it's a very similar look. Even though people see people slightly differently, I'm very similar no matter who looks at me because the frequency that makes this avatar body collapses. We have to learn how to hack our, the nature of our reality. We have to learn how to hack the nature of our reality, right? We have to understand a couple of things. So maybe a small overlap here again from a previous presentation I may have done, but we have to tell people about the double slit experiment, right? We have to understand that this experiment was done uh, just as a random thing. Let's see what particles look like Microscopic particles would look like on the, on, on the back wall of a box if we shot them through a slit, just so we can analyze what happens when they have the impact against the wall. Something crazy happened. <coughs> First of all, they started shooting individual particles from a microscopic little gun through the slit. When they were shooting it through the slit, they were like, okay, one slit, it just it created a digital pattern. They added a second slit. When they added a second slit, it wasn't digital anymore. When they added a second slit and they were shooting one particle at a time, it created a wave pattern on the back wall. Now, what's interesting is a wave pattern means that the particle was shot from the little gun and turned into a wave of light, a wave of potentials, and then interacted with itself and created a wave pattern on the back wall. So scientists said, man, this is crazy. How can this be? We're shooting solid bits of matter and it's creating a wave pattern. This shouldn't be. So they took a little tiny microscopic camera to put in a looking device to see what was happening. When they put the looking device in there to check out what was happening, this is where it gets interesting. The little electrons that they were shooting through the slits decided, oh, we're being looked at. Now we're going to collapse and maintain our particle status. We'll, make, we'll, we'll, we'll stay solid now. So when the, the act of looking in at, at what was happening told the, the particle, said, okay, well, you guys are looking at me now. I'm going to go ahead and be solid. I'll, be a, I'll make a, a digital uh, mark on the back wall. When you take the camera away, it becomes a wave. When you look at it, it becomes a particle. When you take the camera away, it becomes a wave. What does this mean? It means two things. The first thing it means is that particles, whether it's an atom, whether it's an electron, whether it's a photon, they're all conscious. They're all conscious. Now, just think about that for a minute. Every atom has an electron orbiting it, and that means every electron, and that means every atom is conscious because electrons are conscious because electrons can make a decision. They can make a decision based off of what's looking at them. That's huge. The second thing is. Everything exists first as a wave of potentials before a reality is collapsed into existence. So the importance of this is that your life is not hardcore set. There are alternatives that you can take uh, in your life. You don't have to, it, it, just because of where you started doesn't mean you're going to end up there. Look where I started. Look where I, I started underneath the ghetto. Some of the people that I know today that are hardcore thugs and gangsters, they claim to be hardcore. They couldn't survive what I went through and my family went through. They would, they would, they, they couldn't. A lot of that stuff is fake. It's all a front what they're putting out here on these streets and all this on social media. They, they would be in that situation, man. These, these people would fold underneath the pressure that we grew up under. They would fold. They would literally fold. And so when I go back to that city, which I just went back, uh, Right before, I think it was New Year's Day. New Year's Day, I went back. I try to go there once every year or so. Went through a tour of all my old neighborhoods. And um, what's interesting is some of the people, if they're not dead or locked up, they're still there. They didn't have the vision to see that there was a lot more for them. Some of those people have never left their zip code, literally have never left the zip code. And and they, 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 they broke down and accept the program code that they were given. They accepted that code, and they're just running the software. They're literally running software. They said, you know what? This is my code. This is my program. <clears throat> I'm going to settle on in. This is, me until, this is me until this avatar body expires, right? Some people, like myself and maybe a few others, 
<clears throat> they said, you know what? This is my situation now, but I'm going to break this code and I'm going to rewrite a new life for myself. And it's not going to end like this. It's not, it's not going to end here. And that's what's important for you to understand. They even did this with photons. Same exact result. Showing us that particles are conscious. Particles are actually conscious. And if you understand what that means, you're going to treat everything with respect. Why? Because everything is made of particles and atoms, right? My shirt is made of atoms. Now, where we as human beings screw up, we tend to think that we make things. Man-made. They call it man-made. Man didn't make anything. What man did was we, we found an ingenious way to stack atoms. We take atoms and we operate them. We move them around like Lego blocks. This phone that I have in my hand right now is nothing more than stacked atoms. The atoms are stacked in a way that it turns this into something I can use as a device called a cell phone, right? But the, the fact of making, we didn't make the atoms. The atoms have been here since the beginning of time. These have been here since the beginning of time. We didn't make this, this phone. We stacked the atoms into a format that allowed it to become a phone. But what we did was first we thought about the phone in our consciousness platform. So in the consciousness platform, the phone became real in a multidimensional. From the multidimensional, we took that multidimensional thought and we took it down to two-dimensional by writing it down on a piece of paper, drawing it, or even putting it into a computer program, which is still two-dimensional, a CAD, a computer assisted design. Once we got the phone in there, it's that we took it from multi-dimensions and the conscious platform all the way down to 2D. Then we take it and give it to an engineer who then turns it into a three-dimensional object that we can move around on the XYZ axis in space-time. So what we did was we took the consciousness platform, gave us the concept, the idea. We then converted it to two-dimension, move it into an actual ability for us to create or stack these atoms in a way that we can actually have this in reality. So it's a manifestation. The phone is a manifestation. This jar is the manifestation. Your computer or whatever device you're watching me on is a manifestation of conscious thought. From that, from conscious thought into what we call reality, right? So we're finding out now that light equals intelligence because everything is made of light and every thought you think is a light wave that leaves out of your skull. So every time you think something, that light wave penetrates your skull and it goes out into space time. And it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. So that wave of light is encoded with data from the actual thought. That's why it's important to, to have to watch what you're thinking. Your thoughts are powerful. The thought, your thought light waves actually become a but have a butterfly effect. You can be thinking ill of someone. You could be thinking um, bad thoughts of someone. And that thought can go out and leave into space time encode it with that data and then somebody else can get that frequency believe it or not they can download that same thought frequency that you just let go out of your mind it could have been years ago and now they're operating on that frequency they are it's got it's embedded itself into their program code now they're acting on it for uh, against someone else that's 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 and you know that's in their reality tunnel it's it's crazy we don't understand really fully how powerful this avatar body is. Our bodies send and receive wireless information through the DNA. The DNA scientifically has been found to be able to send and receive information. Scientists took a gram of DNA, which is enough to put a drop on the tip of your finger. They were able to encode data onto the DNA. One scientist named George Church, he had an ebook with pages and graphics and everything in the ebook. He converted the ebook and from, from zeros, and, zeros and ones into A, C, A, T's, C's, and G's, which is what DNA reads. Then he downloaded that book onto the DNA, stored it in a volume. He replicated the book then 80 billion times on one gram of DNA. And then he uh, converted those A, T's, C's, and G's back into zeros and ones and uploaded it back to the server again as a digital book. So we know that DNA stores information in the volume and it can store digital information. Uh, one human body can store 13.8 billion years of data, which is about the same age as the universe. So every single person is a walking storehouse of knowledge and information stored right inside of your body, right into the DNA. And now they found that the atoms can even store information. 
So every atom in your body is storing information right now that just waiting to be unlocked. You can tap into it through consciousness. So we're looking at light waves, and this is important to understand because we have to talk about getting into a high frequency. You hear people say, you need to be in a higher frequency, vibrate at a high frequency. And nobody really, a lot of people, not nobody, a lot of people don't really understand what it is. They can't even visualize what it is. You're looking here at a light wave and you're looking at the wavelength, the amplitude of the electric field and the amplitude of the magnetic field. These fields uh, propagate uh, with the light wave as it moves through space time, including the light waves that come out of your head, your thoughts, all your thoughts. And we know that lights come out of the head because we can take a cap with electrodes on it, put it on your scalp, and then have you think about things and we can capture all those thoughts into a computer. So it's real, all right? Just like the, the, the TV show, I Love Lucy from the 1960s, those radio waves from that night, I Love Lucy TV show are still in space right now. They've traveled outside of our solar system. That's how far away they've gotten at the speed of light. And if you're, an, if you're a distant civilization in space and you have the technology to decode the radio wave, which is a wave of light, it's a light wave, you can watch I Love Lucy, okay? The same thing is happening with our minds, the same exact thing. And so to get on a high frequency, you have to understand that your, the information you're taking in affects the way that your mind emits waves of light and the way that your body emits energy and frequency. So if you're in a state of fear, doubt, if you're in a, uh, in a state of uh, turmoil, depression, those are low frequencies, okay? Those are low frequencies. So what happens is those low frequencies produce uh, these different types of uh, amplitude, wavelengths, and, uh, and, and troughs. So you can see here this wave as it propagates across this plane. Now, this right here would be considered a low frequency wave because the height and the trough are, uh, are, are very deep and high, but the distance between the trough and the next crest is very wide. So what happens here is this frequency is a what we consider to be a low frequency or a low vibration. Now, we know that when you are looking at, for example, gamma waves and the way that a person, uh, this, the brain is operating and thinking, when somebody's focused and concentrating, you see this same, uh, same exact uh, wave, but it's very short and close together. In other words, the crest and the trough are close together and there's a lot of them. And it looks almost like a cardiac thing when you're looking at somebody's heart uh, meter, right? When they're, when they're trying, you know, you're in the hospital and you're trying to see if, they're, if their heart is operating properly. And so when you have those close in, high and low troughs, crests and troughs very close together, you then create a high frequency. So when you're focusing, when you're intent on something, when you're meditating on something in a way that you're trying to bring it into your reality, when you're, when you're trying to uh, put action into a thought, the brain goes into high frequency mode. Also, they found when you're operating in something called unconditional love, when you're actually thinking about people in a way that you want to be a blessing to them and you want them to be blessed. When you focus on being of service to others, all those create a high frequency vibration in, in the brain. Okay. Low frequency, low frequency vibration, begging, hoping, wishing, depression, doubt, fear. This is why they pump the fear on the TV all day. They pump fear on the news 24 seven, 24 seven. Because once you're in the fear mode, then they can just manipulate you. They can, they can throw you around like a rag doll. They have all the control over you because the body just wants to, to solve the fear problem and they're bringing the fake solution, right? <clears throat> so, you know, we're talking about the oscillation of waves and the hertz that waves oscillate through space time. And the reason why it's important because we're going to be talking a little bit about entanglement of these waves and how these waves actually can entangle with each other, right? It says, keep in mind that some waves, including electromagnetic waves, also oscillate in space. And therefore, they are oscillating at a given position as time passes. The quantity known as the wave's frequency refers to the number of full wavelengths that pass by a given point in space every second. The SI unit for frequency is hertz, which is equivalent to per seconds, written as, and you can see the mathematical conjunction there. So 
basically, we're talking about the fact that these, what I'm telling you scientifically, I'm backing it up, that your thoughts are going into space encoded with information from what you were thinking. There's no way to get around it. So a human being exists both as solid matter and a wave of light. <clears throat> you're both. You're both solid and you're both a wave of light. Wave particle duality. And so since we're both, we have, we exist in a superposition. We, we exist in a state of superpositions. We exist in a state where there's a lot of probabilities. And now we're operating in something called the hermetic principle of cause and effect, where every decision we make is going to have a consequence. It could be a good consequence or a bad consequence, but there will be a consequence. So as you're beginning to make decisions on things and put action behind conscious thoughts, you have to sometimes think of what the potential consequence could be. Could it be a good outcome or is it going to be a, not, a non-favorable outcome, right? And the reason why you have the capability of doing that is because you exist in a probable state, in a state of probabilities. The future is not hard-coded and written. You can actually change it by each decision that you make. There's people that grew up where I grew up and they decided to go down the left fork and I went up the right fork, right? They went one way, I went the other way. You know, and so um, it doesn't make them either right or wrong or make me either right or wrong, but it's just the paths that were taken at that time. But those paths lead to places. Now, at any time, they could begin to make decisions that would then reroute them slowly to a new path. We have that capability too. I've made many, many mistakes in my life and I've had to reroute myself many times. And so, and, and everyone will have to go through that. But understanding the process that we're going through to do that and understanding how it works is key to manifesting. It's very, very key. Remember, the reason why we can't see all the light waves that are emanating around us right now is because we only see 1% of the light spectrum. We really get red, green, and blue. That's pretty much what we get. The colors of the rainbow are in there. Then that's it. We don't see x-rays, gamma rays, infrared, microwaves, radio waves. We don't see that stuff. That stuff is operating all around us. Ultraviolet and all this stuff is all around us. Okay? We, we only see a very slip, a small sliver of reality is all we're given. A very small sliver. In all its vibrance and glory, it's still only a small sliver of, of what's really out here. So law of vibration might not as be well known as the law of attraction. However, the law of vibration serves as the foundation for the law of attraction. To understand that this, it's important to know that everything is energy. Science through quantum physics is showing us that everything in our universe is energy. When we go down on a subatomic level, we don't find matter. Pure energy is what we find. We're made of waves of light. Okay, we are made of waves of light. That's science. Important to understand what's going on here, because when you're going into manifesting and understanding that we have to sync with the information, we have to sync with the reality that we want through what? Through what? Through light waves. Manifestation is not just a belief. A lot of people think that manifestation is belief. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get this thing. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to. I'm going to win this or I'm going to whatever. Unfortunately, manifestation is commonly misunderstood. Too many people portray manifestation as a belief system, in my opinion, rather than something that's, you know, naturally going to happen. Uh, just saying that you're going to get something and oh, I'm going to I'm going to get this. That's not going to really get it done. Now, situations may be in alignment that that does happen for you. But if you look at a track record over a course of time, you'll find that that thing happening, whatever it is, over multiple attempts, is going to be very, very low. Manifestation requires a process, a process that a lot of the elites of the world, a lot of very, very super wealthy people, super, super wealthy people, they understand these concepts and operate and utilize them on a daily basis. A lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the big scientific communities and so forth. Same exact thing, right? They all operate uh, in these 
this realm of manifestation and understanding a lot of the techniques and things that I'm talking to you about today because they understand that it's real and that it actually works, including the people that helped to write the school books and everything else for, <laughs> for our kids to go to school. They know exactly what the, the future they're creating. They want to create a multitude of ignorant people and only having a few light bulbs shine at a time uh, that they will rise to the top while everyone else is just a very, very dim light. That's exactly what they want, because by that method, they can maintain power and control over the masses. You see? <clears throat> so what does manifestation mean? Uh, let me just check this real quick to make sure there's no error here. Okay. So what does manifestation mean? <clears throat> Before we look at the science behind manifestation, let's develop a general understanding of what the term means. Manifestation refers to a physical sign that something is happening or being solidified in reality. Because remember, first it exists as a possibility. Manifestation especially means to bring something tangible into your life through attraction and your belief system. It's not enough to have superficial thoughts. You actually need to truly believe that you will be able to turn your dreams into reality. That means that you need to be able to visualize and experience <clears throat> how it will look like to achieve specific goals. The reason for that is your nervous system. <clears throat> Manifestation is a holistic approach to goal setting through adapting your mindset and behaviors. It means that bringing your dreams into reality by living your goals, okay? You're bringing your dreams into reality by living your goals. In other words, this manifestation process is so ingrained into a person once they take it on and really activate it. In other words, we're doing it already, but once you really fine tune it, it becomes every part fiber in your body. It be, it's part of your, even in your nervous system. It's tapped into your whole central nervous system. And you begin to set goals and, and achieve those goals. You're living the manifestation in real time. <clears throat> So I know that, for example, <clears throat> with my radio, with my TV network, I'm sorry, I want to get to 1 million subscribers, right? Now, along the way, I don't just say I want 1 million subscribers. That's what I, I want. I'm going to get 1 million subscribers. That's good. I'm good to go. It's going to happen. Doesn't work that way. A few things have to happen. The first thing is I have to set benchmarks for myself. So I set benchmarks on the way to the 1 million subscribers. I've got to reach this by this time. I've got to reach this by this date. i got to reach this by this date. This has to happen by this date. This many shows have to be released by this time. And by doing that and hitting those benchmarks, I'm living the manifestation as it's becoming a reality uh, in real time. So I'm living the goals. I'm living inside the actual manifestation on my way to the ultimate goal. That's important because the second thing to that is it requires the action, actionable steps. If you don't have actionable steps to get to what you're trying to manifest, you're not going to get there. You can wish and hope all you want. It's not going to happen for you unless you have the actionable steps in place. We have uh, some information tonight that I'll be showing you at the very end that will give you that ability to create your actionable steps on a daily basis. <clears throat> your magical superpower, your nervous system. Let's start with some basics. The nervous system consists of central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, cranial, spinal, and peripheral nerves. The entire nervous system is what allows us to have a holistic experience as human beings. This is what allows us to feel, think, do, and be. It is important to understand that in order to develop the ability to manifest ideas into reality, you need to think, feel, do, and be what you want your reality to look like. This is why the nervous system is so important in manifestation. You have to understand that, uh, you know, without it, you can't really tap into the experience of what you're trying to live in, what you're trying to be in, okay? For example, uh, if you want to, if you're trying to buy a new house, okay? I don't care if you don't have the down payment and the closing costs yet. You need to go out and start looking at houses. You need to go get the, the real estate magazines, go online. Now you can just go online and look at properties. You can go on, you can go on social media now. They got great social media uh, uh, accounts that have properties and houses on them now. Start shopping these properties and houses and look at the interiors, the exteriors, making a list of all the things you want and don't want, what you can live with, what you can't live with. 
envision yourself actually buying this house, <clears throat> you know, going out and touring properties and, and, and seeing, walking through them and, and experiencing the house and feeling the energy in the house and seeing how the energy, if the energy rocks with you, driving through the neighborhood where potentially you might live one day, if that's the one that's going to be for you and feeling the energy there and seeing how you fit in, you know, I mean, that's what it takes. <clears throat> one time I, I got a hotel in a place and I just lived in that little area for a little while to see if it was for me. All right. To be able to see if this was the, what I, what my, what my reality could, if I can accept this kind of reality, if I'm part of it, if I want to be a part of that. And so your nervous system is important because it allows you to encapsulate your sensory perception and the sensory perception sends a signal back to the universe and says, Hey, this guy's living this reality. Let's bring this to him. Let's make this happen. So if you want a car, like you heard me talk about before, what color, what model, what make, what kind of interior, what kind of audio player, what kind of rims, right? What are all the options? What kind of steering wheel even? You know, what horsepower? Is it turbo, non-turbo, rear wheel, front wheel, formatic? What is it? You need to know all these things before you think you have any chance of getting it. You need to know exactly what it is, and then you need to meditate on it using Cruz's techniques that you learned earlier from Kenny Garcia, Cruz, on thinking about the actual item, meditating on the actual thing, as if you're living it. When I, med when I have my manifestation meditations, it's pure neurological system. I'm actually living in the moment in the meditation. I'm in the house. I'm in the car. I'm on the vacation. Whatever it is I'm trying to manifest. All right. I'm, all, all, I'm living it. I'm celebrating. I had a manifestation of a, of a huge business success. And in the manifestation uh, meditation, I was actually celebrating the, you know, the success. So what happens is that is transmitted now to the universe. And that success for me is guaranteed. That movement into that house or that car or, or that relationship or whatever it is, it's guaranteed because I'm moving in that way and I'm telling the universe specifically, I'm being very, very specific. This is what I want. I'm not being <clears throat> ambiguous. Some people are being very ambiguous. Oh, yeah, I, I, I want I want to get a house. OK, well, where? Uh, I'm thinking uh, you lost already. You lost. You didn't you didn't you don't have the information. The universe they can't really, it can't decode that program. That code is, that code is weak. You don't even know where. You don't know what's your price range. You don't know what the mortgage payment would be. Have you done any calculations as to what you can afford with the mortgage? No, I didn't do that yet. Do you know if it's going to be a conventional loan or if it's going to be an FHA loan? What kind of credit do you have? Is that going to hold? Do you need to go non a stated income or can you do a stated, a full doc deal? You don't know. You don't know what that means either, right? You see? So this is why people go, I've been wanting all this stuff and nothing happening. Well, you're not getting specific. You're not, <clears throat> you're not becoming an expert in what you want to manifest. You need to become an expert in it. You need to know everything about it. I know that when I wanted to get this 2021 S580 Mercedes, this is all the way back in uh, 2020, November of 2020, I believe it was, right? No, no, I'm sorry, November of 2019. Yeah, November of 2019. Uh, it was early release. Then you have to build a car and it takes about six, seven months to get it. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll get it right before 2021. Didn't happen, obviously, because of the whole shutdown of all the, uh, in 2020 and nobody had microchips. So I ended up getting the car only a few months ago, <clears throat> but I built it in 2019 at the, at the Mercedes Benz dealership. I went there specifically to build the exact car that I wanted. My dashboard, the way I wanted it, the steering wheel, the way I wanted it, the package is the way I wanted it the colors, everything the way I exactly wanted it. And I gave the guy $2,000 just to, to, you know, that put my name on this. They build it. You give them two grand, they build a car. <clears throat> you don't even have to buy it. What if you, you decide walk away, you don't want to buy it. That's how it works. But I knew I wanted to manifest this car. And guess what, guys? That car is, is out here right now in my driveway. In my driveway right now. The exact color makes everything that I wanted. It's all there exactly the way I built it. Because why? If I didn't do it that way, if I was just going to go shopping for a car, I wouldn't have gotten what I wanted. <clears throat> it's not enough to just get something. 
get what you want. That's the power of becoming an expert at manifesting. You can literally get what you want, okay? Hold on one second, guys. So you can get what you want. You can literally become an expert in it, at it, you know? Um, recently, I have a driver who drives me around. And uh, I, there's two reasons why I have a driver, too. Not that I need to explain it to anybody, but one reason is I, I work so hard and work so much that when I get behind the wheel of a car, my brain, the real exhaustion hits me, and then I start getting drowsy very fast. And there's been a lot of times I had to pull over and stop to take a break. And after that gentleman got uh, got killed by the cops a few years back who was sleeping in the parking lot of Wendy's because he was tired, I said, I can't do that no more. I have to have a driver, right? Long distances, I got to have a driver. Somebody, anything over 30 minutes, I need somebody to come get me, take me around. And uh, the second reason is, is because I get work done. So while he's driving, I'm working. I'm, so I'm maximizing my time. And so the, the little bit of money that he gets versus what I'm earning is makes sense to me all right uh now he came to me and he was like uh, a couple months ago you know he has when i'm not when he's not driving me he's got other clients out there he just needs a nice suv everybody wants this brand new cadillac truck right it's a shortage of these trucks out there because of the chip and everything and the, it has to have specific features <clears throat> you can get some but they're not going to have all the exact features that the people like when they actually book these these trucks be able to drive around in like these are like right now the, the account he has is a royal family coming from Dubai or something. So <clears throat> I'm going, wow, I need to manifest this truck because other guy he had doesn't didn't have the car anymore. Uh, and I'm like, man, if I can find if I can fit into this slot, <clears throat> I can get a vehicle. I can have him drive this vehicle. I can actually uh, make money with it. It could be a dual benefit because this is a vehicle that's an SUV. I can put bigger things in packages, cases, boxes, take to warehouse instead of putting them in a car. And sometimes I can make two, three trips as well as <clears throat> when I start flying in um, a lot of company, a lot of uh, clients to come film shows, uh, we go send an Escalade to go pick them up and put three or four people, four or five people in one car. It just made a lot of sense. Plus, I can make money. I could probably make between six to ten thousand a month off this car. So I started looking, looking, looking. I couldn't find these features and functions. I sat back for a minute. I literally just took a deep breath, started a meditation, focused on exactly what car I wanted. I focused on exactly what options that I wanted that I needed. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> and then literally uh, got back on, <clears throat> sorry, Auto Trader, opened up Auto Trader. I expanded uh, my reach to nationwide. This was the next day. And when I went nationwide, up pops the exact one that I needed. Brand new. And guess where it was? <laughs> it was 20 minutes away from my house. I literally ran to my car and raced down there. I looked at it. I opened the door. The kid is the kid there. The kid was 21 years old selling these cars. I'm like, how do you get this judge car? Selling this car, these expensive cars. Anyway. Uh, he, he says, you want to drive it around? I said, no, I, this is a brand new car. I didn't know what they can do. He says, uh, you want to um, go to work sit with the financing guy? I said, don't worry about the financing. My leasing company will contact you tomorrow and wire you the money for the car. The guy goes, man, this is the craziest deal I've ever done. I said, don't worry. It'll be done tomorrow. I'll, be, I'll get the keys. Sure enough, of course, that's exactly what happened. But I manifested this car just like this on a, on a drop of a dime, a car that's with all these specific functions and features that is extremely rare by just doing a manifestation meditation, taking a deep breath, the next day, it pops up on the radar right down the street from my house. So this is how powerful you can be when you get into tapping into the nervous system and the subconscious and, and linking those two things together. Because what you're experiencing here in the multidimensional state, in the consciousness platform, and linking it to your, 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 your nervous system by living it, all of a sudden, the universe gets a very, very specific uh, list of, of requirements. And then it just, boom, there it goes for you. Just like that. And the first week that that truck went out, it made me 10 grand the first week. It was two weeks, really, total time. But the first week, you know, for he came and got it and went out. And it was Art Basel. 
and he was driving all these famous people around for Art Basel and uh, 10 grand right away, just like that. So it, it paid off that quick. Plus, plus, I'm driving a free truck. I got a free car. I don't have to pay for the car. And so I did my first Rolls Royce. I rented it out and I drove the car for free. I wanted a Rolls Royce. I was like, OK, but I don't want to spend three grand a month on a car payment. I said, oh, why don't I just rent the car out? So I started thinking about um, renting a car out. What, what apps have rental cars? How can I rent this car out? And a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, uh, I got a friend over in Naples at the Ritz-Carlton who's looking for uh, a luxury, uh, uh, exotic cars. If you can get one, he can keep it rented out as long as you want. I was like, oh my God, I was just looking for a place to rent exa- exotic cars. I didn't want to do the Toro thing because I don't want to have to keep delivering the car. He said, man, this guy does everything right at the Ritz-Carlton. I drove over there, shook hands, Blah, blah, blah. Check this operation out. Done deal. Blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, I was renting out my car uh, 10, 15 days a month at 900 bucks a day. OK. And, uh, you know, the car paid for itself. I don't have to pay any money for that car. <clears throat> Let's say you would like to start a nonprofit organization that benefits homeless people. But you have rarely worked with homeless people, nor are you a person that donates money to organizations that help homeless people. If you're honest, this idea comes from your need to raise social status and gain access to a specific club that requires you to be a volunteer. It requires some volunteer work, right? You're just trying to fit in somewhere. No matter how much you want to manifest your project success, you are not going to be successful with it. And the reason obviously is apparent. You're not passionate about it. You don't really believe in it. You're just kind of going along with the flow because it's something you've got to do. It's a little checklist you got to check off So in that case, wanting to manifest a a successful campaign in raising these funds for this cause is most likely not going to go that well because your heart really isn't into it. I'm just trying to give you a metaphor here so you can understand when you're trying to manifest reality, you're trying to bring something into your reality tunnel. You have to understand that you really need to be passionate about what you're trying to do. You know, I was passionate about that car. I was like, man, okay, I got to get this thing. I sat down. I stopped everything. I meditated on it. I searched, searched, searched. I meditated on it. The next day it pops up. I literally ran out of my front door, got in my car and raced down to that place. Because I know that car is such a hot commodity. There were 38 left in the country with that specific um, package. And so that's passion, though. That's like I'm saying, hey, I really want this. Some people, they dilly dally, take their time. You know, I'll check on it later. Uh, They're not passionate really about whatever the thing is. They're kind of into it, kind of not into it. They're not even honing their expertise on the topic or the issue or the problem or whatever they're trying to create. And so you get the you put a half assed mindset in, you're going to get a half assed result. That's the way that it works. <clears throat> so manifesting is not a shortcut. It is an alignment of your belief system, your actions, your feelings and intentions. It's not a religious practice, but can, but can be compared to the practices of praying or visualizations. Through visual or verbal repetition, our brain creates new neural pathways that will increase your ability to succeed with your intentions. The more you go through the motions in your mind, the more you start manifesting. That is the science behind neuroplasticity. We're talking about something here that I learned at MIT. This is what I took a class in, was applied neuroscience. Research shows that we grow neural pathways, not just through physical practices, but also through visualization. Your neurons grow through any kind of practice. Practicing focus uh, makes you more attentive. If you practice playing the violin, you become more proficient. Uh, and it, if you practice procrastination, <clears throat> you're focusing. Hold on a second, guys. I'll tell you, this thing is. Uh, sorry about that. If you practice procrastination or focus on pessimism or any negative feelings, you will grow new circuits to make those circuits 3,000 times more efficient. Okay. <clears throat> so you have to understand the way the mind works. <clears throat> Man, I can't wait to get this out of my out of my chest. I've been taking my primatine mist, but boy, it's taking a long time to clear up. That ordeal I did outside and that three hours of cold really got me. 
Okay. But the blessing is I didn't, I don't have a cold and I didn't get sick. I still haven't gotten that crazy COVID bug. I'm trying to be the last man standing. <laughs> it's this crazy thing. Me and my sister were laughing at that. We don't, we feel like we're the only two people that haven't gotten this thing yet. <clears throat> anyway, that means that you are always manifesting in your nervous system, whether you are aware of it or not, whether you are calling it manifestation or not. Our nervous system is programmed to align our outer world to our inner state of self. That means that you see the world the way you want to see it based on evaluated or on your internal beliefs through feelings and actions. So this is really important, understanding that the way that you're feeling about something, the way that you're um, your intentions are about something is affecting the way you manifest whatever it is. So just like you can intentionally manifest something, you can unintentionally manifest disaster. You can unintentionally manifest problems and turmoil and heartache. You can unintentionally manifest these things into your life by the way you're operating. Because guess what? Manifestation operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, both Law of attraction works in good law of attraction, high vibration, and law of attraction works also in low vibration. So what does that mean? It means that whatever you're doing at any given moment in the day is creating a manifestation of some type, whether you like it or not. So it's best to be an expert in what you're trying to manifest. Otherwise, you can keep manifesting uh, a hard way to go. I have a friend, you've heard, some of you heard me say this before. I went to high school with this guy. Every time he calls me, he's got a nightmare. I mean, every time he calls me, he's got a problem. And he doesn't call me with any good news. He never calls me with good news. I'm like, dude, <clears throat> you're, you're bringing me down, man. Every time you call me, it's a problem. And, and, that, and you know, the, the thing that makes it even worse is I would give him solutions to these problems and he would never take my advice. And I'm like, oh, man, I had to block the guy. I had to block him. He's manifesting this, this reality that he's got. Okay? You know what I'm saying? He literally, somebody said, you're killing my vibe. Yeah, he's killing my vibe, Brock. You know? And um, <clears throat> he, he's, uh, he's still, even today, and that was about a year or two ago, he's still, even today, trying to contact me. And he knows I'm ignoring him. And now he tries to call me from different phone numbers because he wants to air out this negativity and these problems. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to hear it. Don't call me. I can understand people, if you, especially if you have a friend, they're going to call you with their problems because that's normal, right? But everything can't be a problem. Like at some point, man, you got to give me something, some good news or something that's at least neutral. It can't be every time I see the phone ring, my frequency drops. I'm like, oh, this guy. Oh, my God. If I answer this call, I know this guy was going to ramble for 30 minutes about some crazy stuff. Right. And he's not even going to listen to any advice that I could potentially give him. And if I give him the advice, he won't even be able to act on it. So I had to block him because he was bringing me down. And he was when, when I go down, a lot of people go down. I'm responsible for a lot of people. So I have to optimize myself. And doesn't mean I'm perfect because I do have my ups and downs. But doggone it, I'll be damned if I'm going to be down more than I'm up. And so when things like that happen, I got to start. You got to start cutting people off. You got to cut people off. That's ruining your vibe. That's bringing you down because that frequency drop. When I started recognizing every time I saw his phone, his name on my phone, I would go, oh, that's a drop. That's a severe drop. That's like jumping off a cliff with the frequency. And then from there, everything that I'm trying to do that day for the rest of the day, it's not going to be as efficient. It's not going to be as a crisp. It's not going to be as pristine because why? My frequency dropped and now I'm out of rhythm. I'm out of sync. My, 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 my frequency went off with what I was working on, you see? So you have to learn how to cut people off. You could be operating in a state where you're just beginning to learn how to do this manifesting, you're understanding it, and then you got people pulling on you and dragging you and contacting you and telling you all this crazy stuff. The best thing you can do is say, look, I love you, but I need to be I need to uh, block your calls for about 30, 40 days. I'm working on a big project. I can't take any calls right now. And if they really are good people and really loved you, then they would understand. If they don't, screw them. You got to worry about you, man. At some point, <laughs> listen, when you're on an airplane and you're sitting there and the plane's getting ready to take off, 
the stewardess starts giving you all the information about the, the, the escape plan, right? The exit doors and the lights on the floor and all that. They say, listen, if the cabin loses pressure and these oxygen masks drop out of the ceiling, what's the first thing they tell you to do? They say, put on the oxygen mask first for yourself before you help anybody else. Make sure oxygen is flowing to your nose and to your throat. Make sure you're getting that air. You can't help nobody until you get in the air. If you ain't getting no air, you can't help a damn person. You can't, you no good. You're going to think you're helping people, but you're spinning your wheels. You're spinning your wheels and you're putting more stuff on your plate. See? So you have to understand that. you got to get that oxygen, man. And it's not being selfish. It's like at some point, you got to take care of you because if you aren't taken care of properly, you can't help anybody else properly. I mean, it doesn't mean you couldn't give somebody a quarter or a dime or a sandwich or something. But overall, on the big scheme of things, if you're not operating at your at your best potential or moving towards that, then what you're doing is you're short certain you're shorting short circuiting yourself and even others because you could be even more grand, more big. You could do bigger things. So, on your path to manifestation, just realize something: you might have to cut people off. People that have low frequency, low vibes, stay away from them. Avoid them like the plague. Avoid them like they got they just got fresh COVID. They just got the fresh new Delta combined with the Omicron and the, and the whatever they got else out there. Act like that, man. You act, listen, I can't, <laughs> I can't rock with you, man. You contagious right now. Okay. And you see them when you see them. It is what it is, man. Sometimes solitude is the best thing, especially when you're working on something, a project, a business, an idea, a relationship, whatever it is. Sometimes solitude is the best thing for you. Get rid of all these people, man. It's too many distractions, too many distractions. Cut everybody off. When I wrote my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, it's a 15-chapter book. I talked about writing that book for a year and a half. I kept saying, I'm going to write this book, I'm going to write this book. One day I sat down and I said, I haven't written this damn book. You know what I said? Unacceptable. It's 15 chapters. I already knew that because that's what I had outlined. I'm going to do one chapter a day. I turn off the phones. I turn off the everything. Oh, you know, nobody can contact me. Nobody can call me. Everything was on do not disturb, not off, but do not disturb mode. So they couldn't get through. And uh, I told my kid, I said, listen, my, my youngest son, I was like, listen, I'm going to be out off the chart, off the, off the radar for a minute. Okay. Uh, he didn't live with me. So it's okay. I was like, I'm going to be, I'm working on this book. I got 15 days. The only thing I did was call out for Uber Eats and DoorDash. That was it. And in 15 days, I had a book that became a bestseller for two years running. That's what happens when you focus. That's what happens when you, when you want to manifest something. You lock in and you block everything out. Everybody's got to be blocked out. And if they really love you, they'll understand. And if they, if they don't understand, man, you know, it just is what it is sometimes. It just is what it is. That's just reality. Don't take it personal. Why it's not enough to just believe that your dream will come true. At times, some thought leaders are mystifying your ability to achieve your goals and turn your dreams into reality through terms such as manifestation. It sounds a lot more powerful than talking about your nervous, your neurons and your brain. Unfortunately, this also portrays a general issue that we are seeing in our societies, the disconnect between the body and the mind and the contradictory, contradictory belief of empowering others. We can't empower others because we all have the same abilities. It is true that some have more fortunate outer circumstances than others, but generally speaking, you own your own computer and your own power. And this up, it's up to you to step into your own power and use your abilities to turn your dreams into reality. You and only you control your mind and the way you see your environment. So if you're going back to where I grew up, Right. I have a friend that grew up right next door to me and he became a drug dealer, got shot in the back and is paralyzed in a wheelchair. I don't know if he's still alive now, but the last time I saw him about 10 years ago, he was uh, 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 still in a wheelchair from the waist down. I grew up right next door to him in the same exact conditions. And I went on to become a, uh, an entrepreneur and a TV host. I'm not saying that I'm better than this guy. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we have choices that we can make. We have decisions. We have choices that we can make. I have five kids, right? 
Each one of my kids is on a totally different path. I have one kid, my oldest kid, who's 31. He's a knucklehead. He's a knucklehead. He had everything growing up, you know? And he took a path to me that doesn't make any sense. He's a knucklehead. It is what he is. I'm just going to call a spade a spade, right? And so I'm looking and saying, wow, all the kids grew up fairly in the same conditions except for my youngest son. And it seems like uh, him and my, uh, my, my oldest daughter and my youngest son seem to be excelling at a much higher pace. But pretty much overall, they all had a decent life. But you see that everybody takes a different trajectory based on their decision-making ability, all right? That taught me something huge. Growing up well off, growing up underneath the gutter, you look at it and you say, wow, okay, this person ends up here. These people are doing okay, but some of them still ended up in this situation. It's all based off the decisions. That's why, you know, as a parent, uh, I go to sleep good at night. I sleep like a baby. I sleep like an embryo in a womb. Because I did my job and I did it damn good. Now it's up to everybody's own decisions. Whatever decisions they're going to make is going to be the path that they, that they go on, you know? And so you have to understand that. But you have to, you have to understand that when you're getting into uh, manifesting, it's all about decisions. It's all about execution of decisions. It's all about understanding how this decision is going to lead you to the next thing that's going to lead you to the next thing that's going to get you to your goal. And understanding that people around you are going to want to stop you from hitting those goals. They are going to pull you down. Okay. They're going to grab you. Thank you, Rami Ali. They're going to grab you and try to pull you down. Literally. Uh, trust me, this is going to happen. And then when you make it, they're going to want to, if this, let's say it's financial success, they're going to want a piece of all the action. And if you don't give it to them when they want it, then you're going to be uh, demonized. <laughs> so be prepared for that too, in case you're trying to become financially successful. It happens. All right. <clears throat> so yes, I believe that you can manifest your dreams by taking actions, changing your thought patterns and recalibrating your emotions by strengthening positive neural pathways that will allow you to think not just more positively, which helps you cultivate grit, but be more creative and creativity is not just the ability and artistic of thinking, but the ability to solve problems and see problems and opportunities. It's about cultivating a mindset that enjoys solving puzzles instead of being frustrated by them. You have to become a problem solver in manifesting. Manifesting a lot of times is not just going to be, oh, I thought about it. I meditated on it. I have a lot of good energy now and it just pops right up. Sometimes that's the way it works. Sometimes it's a little bit more intricate depending on what you're trying to actually manifest, right? Like, for example, I'm trying to manifest 1 million subscribers on my TV network. That's a big goal of mine, right? One of my competitors just hit a million, so why can't I hit a million subscribers? And so along the way, building a business from scratch and building your team and having unforeseen things happen and occur along the way, you can become very frustrated in an instant and be like, man, the heck with this thing. I'm tired of this, blah, 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 blah. Or you can see all those things as just puzzles that need to be solved. So when you're trying to create the reality you want, you have to understand that the universe may not just completely unfold and lay it, roll out the red carpet for you in that way, and depending on what particular thing you're working on. There's still going to be little sidebars and distractions and issues and problems and things you got to fix and work on and change and everything else right? Along the way. And you got to be prepared for that and understand that these things are coming. Unforeseen things are going to come. How you handle it will be, will determine how you end up creating the manifestation or not creating the manifestation that you're working on, right? Are you going to manifest your, manifest your reality that you want, or are you going to manifest an unfavorable reality or somebody else's reality by giving up completely? The reason why there's more business people or less business people than, than workers is because it's hard. <laughs> it's not easy. And there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with it. I'm responsible for a lot of people. A lot of people, if I don't get up and move around and do what I do, a lot of people don't feed their babies. A lot of people don't pay their rent and their mortgages. A lot of people don't make their car payment. A lot of people don't have food to eat. And that's all on me. So that's a lot of pressure, man, for a business person. That can be a lot of pressure for some people. 
Some people just aren't built for that kind of pressure. You see? So it just depends. The law of attraction. It's sometimes, you know, confused to be something different from manifestation, but it really isn't. Some people would disagree with this, but you do attract what you believe because your beliefs reflect your actions and body language. So if I walk up to you in public and, <clears throat> and I walk up to you with an attitude and look at you like with a, with a, with a snarl on my face and, and look you up and down and roll my eyes, that's going to manifest a negative vibe between us instantaneously, <clears throat> right? So in that, in that, by that method, I actually, um, my body language reflected a manifestation. If you're cultivating a positive mindset, a mindset of hope and opportunity, you will be vibrating with positive energy. Smiling comes easy to you. Okay. Smiling comes easy to you. Cheering for others and congratulating them on their success brings you joy. I literally get happy when I see people become successful. I get happy when I see people, even if they're my competitors, when they hit an achievement, when they hit a goal, I get happy. I get excited. You know why? Because it makes it more real even for me. I'm not like, oh, man, they did this and they did that. I can't believe I didn't get it. And that's crazy. That manifests a very low frequency and a very low vibration. There's a lot of people who created even Instagram accounts and YouTube accounts to go against me because they started the same time I started. And my stuff took off and theirs really didn't take off. They've had to reopen new accounts over and over again and keep losing their accounts and everything. And so because of that, they see my success and they get angry and they, and they lash out. That's going to happen to you too. They lash out. Cheer people for their successes. Congratulate them on their success. Don't be a player hater. <laughs> Don't be a pocket watcher or an envious person. That kind of frequency is so low, you'll never manifest anything. All you're going to manifest is more doom and gloom for yourself and ulcers, probably. See the world as a place of opportunity and not pain. I see this world literally as a place of opportunity. That's all I focus on. If you look at my track record and look what I've done, I didn't like what was on the radio. I made my own music. I didn't like what was on TV. I made my own TV network, right? Anything that I don't like, I create my own. I don't like the monetary system that they have with the fiat currency. I'm, I now made my own cryptocurrency that's coming out in, uh, next week. Everything that I see that I don't like, instead of complaining and whining and complaining, I try to find solutions. I don't like the social media platforms that are out here. I don't like the way they have the algorithms and the AI and they, and they oppress people and they suppress freedom of speech. So I created my own social media platform. You see? So this is what it's saying here. I'm saying to you, you know, see opportunities, not the pain. See the pain, understand the pain, digest it, discern it, and then figure out what can I do to provide a solution? Because providing a solution to this problem could be the way that I get to my manifestation goal. Learn how to become a problem solver. And the best problem solver is a genius who solves a problem before it even happens, All right? So those are just a few results of a mindset that practices manifestation. We're talking about the manifestation mindset that operates in the law of attraction. Research shows that positive and optimistic people attract others. And, more, and the more people believe that believe in you and your cause, the more chances you have to turn your crazy big dreams into reality. And, let this, and let's be honest. Who wants to be around grouchy people that easily criticize and are incapable of even enjoying a moment? That's why I try to tell you guys. Some of you guys are following, not all of you, but some of you may be following these doom and gloom social media accounts. All they post is doom and gloom. They never have anything good to say. There's never, there's never any good news. You got, if you're trying to manifest something in your life, unfollow those people. Pause them. Go back and follow them again later. Pause them. That that's also constitutes negativity. If they're doom and gloom, and, but they have no solutions. If you're bringing the doom and gloom, but you're bringing a solution, you're trying to solve a problem, okay. But if it's just doom and glooming, whining and complaining, you might as well just be a, might as well just be a baby having a temper tantrum. Right? It's a waste. It's a waste. I see people 
uh, hovering over these 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 network those those pla- those uh, accounts, hovering over them and waiting for the next one to come out so they can so they can chime in all the negativity in the comments. I'm like, what are you guys doing? This is nothing but a smorgasbord stew of negativity going on over here. These people aren't going nowhere with their life, I, and I mean nowhere. That negativity and that and that darkness is going to spill over into their own reality with their wife and their kids and their family members and their friends and everybody else. And everybody's going to be like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? It all starts with the information overload from these doom and gloom accounts, right? You got to get away from them. You're trying to manifest, get away from them. They're dangerous. <clears throat> what can you do to start manifesting your dreams? For one, develop a regular sleeping schedule. Your brain cleans itself during the night by washing out the debris that's floating around. There's actual debris in your brain floating around. It's waste material, all right? Your brain is, is, is a powerful thing, and it burns a lot of calories, too, by the way, when you're thinking a lot. But there's also waste material that ends up there. That waste is being built up during the day when your brain consumes high amounts of energy, which takes energy to manifest. So if you're really trying to become a master manifester, you're using a lot of energy, you're going to need to get some rest. I'm not saying to sleep for eight and 10 hours and all that, but make sure you get an adequate enough sleep for your body, right? Everybody's different. Debris is mostly left over protein that can form clumps that are toxic to the brain, if not processed and washed out through our lymphatic system. That means if you don't sleep enough, your brain doesn't get the chance to wash itself out, which leads to debris buildup. Or in other words, brain fog. So if you've got brain fog and you're trying to be a manifester, you got a problem, okay? <laughs> you got a real problem. So you need to get some rest. Make sure your lymphatic system is draining and working properly. You know, there's some lymph draining stuff you can look on my social media. You can look on Forbidden Knowledge. We did a whole lymph draining health, uh, video with Dr. Uh, Nicholson from Stop Chasing Pain on Instagram, showing you how to drain all the lymphs in your body, okay? Over time, research shows this is one of the precursors to dementia and losing connective functions. So uh, make sure you get an adequate enough sleep. I don't believe people should be sleeping 8, 10, 15 hours a day. To me, that's ridiculous. But the average person might need between five to six hours of sleep every single day on a consistent basis. Practice gratitude. I did a whole show about gratitude. It's actually on Amazon Prime. It's also on Forbidden Knowledge TV. And it's on uh, Fox now. I think it's airing on Fox. Gratitude. Uh, This doesn't just strengthen your immune system, but it also allows you to recover quicker from difficult events. So listen to what I just said here. Gratitude strengthens your immune system. What do we need right now in this day and age with all this shit going around? Pardon my language here. (laughs) With all these variants and stuff going around. We need gratitude. Gratitude strengthens your immune system. Be thankful. And when I say be thankful, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you. Somebody gives you something, you say, oh, thank you. That's a program. You're just saying thank you as a regurgitating a program code in your brain. Oh, they gave me something. I say thank you. When somebody gives you something, you actually take that thing from them and you hold that thing for a second. And when you say thank you, you focus on actual gratitude, the emotion of gratitude in that statement. And by that method, you move yourself, you shift yourself into the gratitude frequency, which actually raises your immune system, increases, you know, improves your immune system. Thinking about being completely grateful for whatever it is you have at any given moment, focusing on it and actually relishing in that moment of understanding that you're, you're fortunate for this or that or whatever it is and being thankful, that is another form of gratitude that will also uh, strengthen your immune system. Generally speaking, practicing any form of positivity will allow you to succeed quicker in turning your ideas into reality. Thinking positive, okay, finding the light. And I get tweaked sometimes. I'm, I'm guilty of it. Somebody may it takes a lot, but sometimes like today, you know, I normally I'm very good at not responding to comments. I just usually uh, delete them or I, or I, what I do is I put the person on uh, restriction and then I delete the comment. That way they can never comment it again. They can comment, but nobody can ever see it. Right. 
And if somebody makes a comment that's derogatory, but it's a teaching moment, I may respond to that teaching moment so that everybody else can see this is why. But so there's a reason for comment, for responding to comments. Mostly I don't respond. But today, somebody made a negative comment towards my sister. I posted my sister on my account uh, talking about the fact that she was speaking. And some workout guy who looked like he hadn't lifted a weight all year made a comment that she must be on HGH. My sister's an all-natural bodybuilder. Now, one thing that gets me tweaked is you don't, you don't, you don't come at my family. You don't, <laughs> you don't talk about my family. You don't, you don't uh, insult my family. You don't, you, don't, you don't come at my family sideways. That tweaks me. So I responded back to the guy and said, look, man, you know, <laughs> don't, 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 don't play those kind of games with me. Don't, don't do that. You know, so I'm guilty. I, I'll, there's times where you're going to be tested, man. You can be tested. <laughs> you can really be tested tonight. You know, uh, early, earlier today, I got tested with this guy. I ended up going back and deleting the comment, and the, my response. But I realized that that's something I got to work on. But this guy got me tweaked because one thing I, I'm a great guy, but when you come up my family, Ooh, it's really tough then. It's really tough for me to maintain my Zen. Really, really tough for me to maintain my Zen. You got to remember where I came from, man. That's all you got, you know? And if you ain't got that, uh, you know, you got nothing. So, uh, you know, you, you, you protect, you know, and you protect. But um, so it's something that we all have to work on. It's something that we have to really think about. It's not easy. It's not easy, <laughs> you know? Every now and then, man, you know, the, the Miami will come out of me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> It'll, it's in there. Don't think that that's gone. It's still in there. I mean, it's still in there. Right? The real, the real Miami is still in there. So, you have to understand, man, that you can't really destroy evil. All you can do is learn how to control it. <laughs> that's all you can do. You can't stop it. You can't destroy it. You can't eliminate it or remove it. But what we can do is learn how to control the evil, right? And so, uh, those moments of those ups and downs will put you in a situation where you can be out of sync with brain heart coherence. You can be out of sync with what you're trying to manifest. You can be out of sync with what you're focusing on. I had to sit back and take a deep breath because it was stewing in me. And I was up, I, this, I was up to speak next tonight. This happened today. And I realized that I was getting out of my zone. I said, oh man, I fell prey to this energy vampire. Something I always tell people don't do. And it reeled me right in. So I went back and I deleted the whole thing, you know, the comment and my response. And um, I realized, man, I, I, I lost my I lost my Zen right there. You know, so I found that there's another hot spot. I got I know the hot spot is, you know, is, is family. Like, you know, don't come at my kids and my family. That's my hot spot. That's my trigger point. That's my real trigger point. And it's there's there's I've now what I've got to do. I've got to find a way to handle that kind of situation in a way that I can make it into a teaching moment. And not into an aggressive, an aggression moment. And when I can figure out how to flip that into a teaching moment for not only myself, but also the person that's making the statement, then I've won. And so that's something that I realized I got to work on. But you see the process. It's a steady process of trying to figure out who you are, what your triggers are, understanding and embracing those triggers and trying to figure out a way that you can actually become a better person from that. So you don't just stay there. Not you, if you stay there, then you're stagnant. If you're stagnant, you're not manifesting anything. You're just spinning your wheels. So I'm showing you, I'm telling you about myself as an example for you guys that you have to understand it's a process. You know, it's a real process. Uh, light up your peace region in your brain through practices that help you produce oxytocin in your body. This can be anything from listening to music, hugging, mindful meditation, movement, and joyful curiosity. So, you know, you have that peace region in your brain where the oxytocin is released and, you know, just giving your kids a hug, giving your spouse or your friend, your, your better half or your mate or whatever, a hug, a real hug, not one of those, you know, quick thing, but a real, you know, embracement, embracing hug, um, you know, uh, meditation, having mindful meditations. We just, you know, like Cruz was teaching earlier today, curiosity. You know, looking into things and researching topics like maybe you've been curious about the Anunnaki and you just haven't had the time to dig into it. But you know what? I'm going to I'm going to get some some books about this. and I'm going to go research this. And that kind of curiosity, when you start finding answers to your own questions, it releases oxytocin in the brain and that keeps you on a high frequency. 
Set achievable and measurable goals. Having clear goals can in, uh, that you can envision and, and setting them uh, creates uh, stepping stones necessary for you to turn your dreams into reality. Wishing that you will become a millionaire isn't something that can be manifested. You can't say, I wish I was a millionaire. I want to be a millionaire. That's not going to get it done, guys. I'm just telling you right now. But you can manifest the individual steps which you need to take in order to become a millionaire. That's the difference. Understanding the, dif the difference between those two. Some are delusional in what their manifesting idea is or concept of manifesting is. And some people are getting this basic foundation. When you do it in step-by-step -step process, and like I told you earlier, my benchmark says my success, I'm making a situation where I can actually manage what I'm doing. I can control smaller situations over a period of time that can help me reach my end goal, right? That's what it's all about. When I, I remember uh, I wrote myself a check for a million dollars and I would walk around with that check for a million dollars. And I ended up earning that million dollars. I said, okay, this check is cashed. I took that check out. I wrote a check myself a check for $20 million. And I gave myself a deadline for that. I ended up cashing that check for $20 million. Then after that ended, that whole thing, transaction ended and everything else, I, that was a buildup to that number. I said, okay, $100 million. And I said, wait a minute, $100 million? No, $1 billion. So now I walk around with a check in my pocket made out to myself that must be cashed by October of 2026 for $1 billion. Okay? That's the kind of manifesting journeys I go on. But now, what does that mean? That sounds like a big number. But wait a minute. What I did was I put together a whole business plan with a five-year projection. Now I'm managing my steps to get there. I'm not just saying, I'm going to walk around with a check for a billion dollars and I'm going to have a billion dollars in five years. No, it doesn't work that way. I spent eight hours building a whole business plan, a whole business model, a pitch deck and all that. Created, did all the research needed to require to create a five-year projection and a prospectus so that I can understand exactly what needs to be done, where, why, how, and how to get to each one of those steps in a step-by-step -step process month by month until I reach the end result. Okay? One of the things I'm going to send you guys in the email that I sent tonight at the end of this is an additional email that I'm going to send with a link to my private mentoring group on United 99 for the Manifest Destiny event we're on right now. Also, I'm going to send you a link to Live Plan. Live Plan is going to allow people who are on here that are trying to goal set and become entrepreneurs and stuff like that to create uh, projections. And it will create beautiful graphs for you based on the data that you input so you can even print something nice out and see it and feel it and touch it. Okay, and it saves it for you permanently and everything else. So I'm going to give you that link as well. That's an amazing tool that I've been using. That's the tool I used to raise the one, the, uh, the 20 million dollars, the live plan. They got me the 20 million, and right now I'm on my road to one billion. I use live plan again. All right, we did we did round one in the uh, shares that we sold for forbidden knowledge. Round two is starting very very soon, probably any day now. Hopefully sometime this week, they'll increase it from one million to five million. So we can raise an additional $4 million. And then round three will be $50 million. And then after round three, my plan is to go to the stock exchange and get a, get a stock symbol and be on the stock exchange. And that takes me to my billion dollar goal. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's a step-by-step -step process. Um, <clears throat> set achievable and measurable goals. Having clear goals that you can envision and setting achievable stepping stones is necessary to turn your dreams to reality. Have a clear vision. Developing a purpose and a vision for your life will help you set the right intentions. You need to understand why you want to achieve your goals. So having a goal to be, to, to be a billionaire, okay, great. You want to be a billionaire. Well, why? Why do you want to be a billionaire? Why? I have to ask myself these questions. Why do I want to be a billionaire? There has to be a reason. It can't be just so I can have a billion dollars. My reason is legacy. You, it's behind me on this board behind me on my wall. Legacy. My biggest thing now is 
How can I build a legacy for my family? Right? So I'm focused on legacy building. That's why I want to be a billionaire. It's so that for future generations coming far after I'm gone, have a foundation to build on and the mental psychological programming from birth on, to, on how to be successful. So I developed, I developed a legacy project for my, for my family. In my legacy project, my kids, they, uh, we have a meeting. We had a meeting here, which was recorded by video and audio, right, to give my will and my testament and everything else, what they're, what they're going to get in case of my demise or when I finally do pass away. And so it was a hard one for some of them to understand that you don't just get money because I'm gone. There's a set of rules in place. <laughs> In other words, you have to have a certain credit score. You have to be gainfully employed or in your own business for at least one year. If you've been working for only nine months or 11 months and you have to wait for a whole another year, 12 months need to go by. If you're in your own business, well, it needs to be a year old. You need to show that you ran the business successfully. And uh, even if you only made a dollar profit, but that you ran a successful business. You also have to, have to attend my family, private family financial meetings financial classes that I have. If you don't attend the financial classes, you get absolutely nothing. I don't care if you meet every other criteria. If you don't attend my financial classes on how to run and operate and manage money, you get nothing. You get zero. You know, And so you can't be living with a relative. You got to be living on your own or with your spouse or better half, but you can't be living off of somebody, sleeping in somebody's basement or couch or whatever like that. Unacceptable. You have to have a lease or a deed in your name. See? All these things I'm putting in place because I'm building the mindset for the generation that comes after them. At some point, somebody's got to break the curse, the generational curse, and stop this negative programming and this lack of financial literacy to create a whole new paradigm. And then from that paradigm, we'll build a, a mindset of financial literacy and legacy. You see, even my grandchildren that I have, I have four grandchildren. Three and one on the way. The three that were at the meeting with their mom, they understand that when, that when they turn 18, they get some money from the trust fund, but they have to meet requirements just like everybody else. And then when they turn 21, they get a little bit more. And then when they meet more requirements, they get the rest when they hit 25. You don't just give millions of dollars to babies, to 18-year-olds. You see? And where do I get this knowledge from? From my billionaire friends that I have. That's where I get the knowledge from. I'm taking what they've done for generations and pass down what they call old money and legacy to their family. And I'm taking that same exact structure and teaching it to my family. And I'm legacy building. That's why I want to become a billionaire. So I can have an effective, huge change on this planet over a long period of time. You know, not just so I can go on a whole bunch of vacations and stuff like that. I mean, anybody can do that. Right. That's what it's all about. How can I have an, how can I leave an imprint on this planet before I go? <coughs> the concept of law of attraction is fundamentally an ancient concept embedded in universal laws. It asserts that our life is our own creation. We as a consciousness have the ability to influence and create our life events. Many of us have already experienced the manifestation of something that we imagined. Almost ma all major beliefs in all religions talk about this concept in one form or another. In a lot of ways, these religions and these religious systems, if you look at the deep source of where they originated from, you find out that they're really fundamentally based in, in uh, metaphysical truth. They've just been skewed and altered and manipulated for control of people. And so a lot of them really are talking about manifesting. Even in the Bible, it's talking about manifesting. Manifesting your reality. But it gets overlooked and skipped because of all the other distractions that have been added and all the other curated information that's been put in. But it's really an ancient, super ancient concept. Like I told you, the Sumerian tablets, they call themselves the ordainers of destiny. They literally focused on creating their own realities and manifesting everything that they wanted. 